Hello and welcome to the Possibility Podcast. This is session 10 and I am your host, Sarah Knight. Uh, Today I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm not interviewing anyone. Um, I'm going to try to just give you a short little state of the climate report. Some of this will just be going over the basics and some of this will be bringing in some new information um, that I learned after recently attending the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics. Uh, This was a 4,000 person strong Congress uh, brought together some of the top scientists from around the world working on everything from the inner earth to outer space. So climate change was a pretty hot topic. I was there in part because I was giving a couple of workshops and a talk on the subject of human change, our ability to face what we need to face, to cope, to adapt, to do the hard work that we need to do. Um, And really, I was particularly interested in addressing the topic of our stress levels. Are we just too stressed out, too overwhelmed? Do we not have the tools and resources that we need? to be able to look to this problem, face it in the eye, and take action in the way that we need to take action. Um, The response was pretty good. I learned a lot, um, got some good feedback and some good insights, and hopefully um, gave people in the workshops a few good tools that they can use. Um, These scientists are directly embedded in this work. A lot of them have spent their lifetimes working on environments that are now disappearing fighting for a cause that on some days maybe appears to be losing. So as you listen, uh, know that I'm going to be mentioning some pretty big numbers, some pretty hard-hitting facts. And the point of this is not to overwhelm you. That's exactly what I don't want to do. Um, However, we do need to be willing to take in some pretty tough information. What we know that we're doing is turning away on a pretty large scale because this problem is so huge, it's so overwhelming, uh, we don't really know where to begin with this crisis. We're not getting clear leadership, we're not getting clear instruction. In the town where I live, a climate emergency was declared and then nothing happened. You know, is it an emergency? Is it not an emergency? And we just keep on carrying about with our daily lives as if nothing is happening. This is a major, major problem because we do still have time, some scientists say, to avert the worst case scenario, Um, but that requires taking action immediately. And in order to take action immediately, we need to know what we're taking action on. So that's just part of my intention here, is just to tell you what's happening, give you a few maybe new insights, and hopefully you can take this information as best you can, work through whatever feelings come up for you in whatever way you can. Perhaps some of the tips from some of the other podcasts might help you. And maybe use a little bit of this energy of awareness to turn your attention towards your own life, to maybe what you can do, to maybe looking at how you can influence your local leaders, how you can work on shaping different choices, different policies in your community. So please, as you listen, just keep breathing. Remember that whatever information you're hearing in this podcast and in other news sources, that right now you are alive and right now there are possibilities, but maybe not for long. The longer we wait, the more we reduce the number of possibilities that we have. So where I would like to start is actually by mentioning um, the session that my talk was scheduled in at this Congress was called Adapting in the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is a term that you may have heard um, bandied around. It's been used informally um, and with increasing in frequency over the last 15 years by scientific communities. This is a term that has been proposed for the start of a new geological epoch. We, for the last 12,000 years or so, have been in what is termed the Holocene. During the Holocene, we enjoyed a relatively stable climate, but clearly that is changing. So the term Anthropocene has been proposed, anthropo, uh, for man, because it has been suggested uh, that humankind's activities in the world are now the driving force for shaping the planet. That what we do far outweighs what nature is doing to shape our environment, our biosphere, our physical landscape, our atmosphere, our ecosystems, and indeed each other. 
This term, although it has been used informally, is on its way up the ranks to being approved formally. And this would be a really big deal. Uh, The people that are responsible for naming these geological periods of time um, apparently air well on the conservative side. And so to actually have this time period now identified, formally changed from the Holocene to the Anthropocene would be incredibly significant. So, the Holocene, the last 12,000 years. Why the last 12,000 years? Well, we've been in an interglacial period. That is, we came out of a period of glaciation when much of the world was covered in ice about 12, 12 and a half thousand years ago. Now, scientists are looking a lot to our past to try to give us some idea of what we might be expecting in the future as our climate gets warmer. And they do this by studying ice cores. So we have ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica dating back 800,000 years. These ice cores allow scientists to look at what temperatures were like, what atmospheric uh, carbon concentrations were like. So they they can look at what carbon dioxide concentrations were like in the atmosphere. So as I said, we're now in an interglacial period. These periods kind of cycle about once every 100,000 years or so. So once every 100,000 years, we have a warm period. Um, That warm period is followed by a longer cold period, a period of glaciation. And these cycles are governed largely by differences in the Earth's orbit. So whether the Earth is closer to the sun or further away from the sun. So... Again, what scientists are doing is looking to the past. Okay, so what did the last interglacial period bring us? So the one that we were in 100,000 years before this one. So the last interglacial period started about 130,000 years ago and ran for about 13,000 years. So during that interglacial period, the planet became a whole lot warmer even than it is today. Surface air temperatures over Greenland were between 4 and 11 degrees Celsius higher. Um, Over Antarctica, they were about 5 or 6 degrees higher. We don't really know about the rest of the world, as it would have been largely dependent on what the major ocean currents were doing at the time. Um, And today, the ocean currents have a huge impact on what our weather, um, what our climate is like locally. Uh, For example, uh, Europe enjoys the relatively uh, warm temperatures that it does, even though it's on the same latitude as much of northern Canada, because of a major ocean current that brings warm water up from the equator um, across the Atlantic Ocean and towards the European landmass. Now, that's one of the concerns, actually, as we start messing with those factors that govern ocean currents, so salinity and temperature differences. Cold, salty water is heavier cold salty water sinks and that movement drives ocean currents so what happens when we warm things up what happens when we put in more fresh water what happens when we start messing around with that salinity that density driven circulation well we don't really know and there is that is one concern that we're going to start slowing down some of these major ocean currents and having a huge impact on regional climates so what about sea surface temperatures well sea surface temperatures were about one to two degrees higher than they are today. Um, The oceans are much better actually at absorbing and retaining heat than is the atmosphere, but they tend to warm much more slowly. So where are we at now? Well, Now, the sea surface temperature is about half a degree higher than it was in 1870. Although that may not sound like much, it actually is hugely significant. Um, We have accomplished half a degree of warming of our oceans in just 150 years. And that has a major impact that we're already seeing on marine life, on ocean circulation, as I mentioned, on weather patterns, and so much more. What about sea level rise? Well, in the last interglacial period, sea levels were actually about seven meters higher than they are today. So what are we accomplishing with sea level rise? I mean, this is a huge subject of climate change and for our future. Well, since the end of the Industrial Revolution, uh, sea levels have risen by about 25 centimeters 
uh, that's the global average. Some places are the sea level is rising faster than others um, and rising at about three to four millimeters a year. So scientists are looking at the past to see what might be geologically naturally possible for our future and also looking to what it might mean as we accelerate these natural cycles. Now, what's really important is over the last full glacial cycle, so from a period of cold to a period of warm, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere changed by about 80 to 100 ppm. Now, as we know, uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are what are largely responsible for our current warming. So last full glacial cycle saw a change of about 100 ppm. What have we accomplished in the last 150 years? A change of 150 ppm. Way beyond what the last natural period of glaciation showed us. So just what does this mean for what we are pushing our climate into? Well, that's the big question that scientists are continually working on with their data and their models and their predictions. So what does the IPCC say we can expect, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? And what I want to mention here may not sound all that interesting, but it's pretty important um, when we're trying to understand climate science, when we're talking climate science. So what I wanted to just very briefly touch upon are these numbers that scientists use to plug into models to give us ideas for different scenarios um, that we may be able to expect in our future, depending on how we behave today, how we respond to this climate crisis today. And so um, what the IPCC came up with a few years ago were these RCP numbers, Representative Concentration Pathways. And basically these numbers refer to different scenarios of how we continue to emit or not carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And they have four kind of basic scenarios. The lowest end of the spectrum, RCP 2.5, says that we stop emitting carbon right now. So what does that scenario look like for our future? The worst case scenario is RCP 8.5 and that scenario says we continue to emit until the end of this century. And then in between the other two scenarios are kind of more middle of the road ones. We continue to emit for you know another few decades and what does that mean for our future? Well what I noticed at this Congress is that in the past, and I mean, I've been attending um, climate change science talks for 25 years, um, but in the past few years, as these RCP numbers have been, have been used when they're put in place um, by the IPCC back in, I think it was 2014 in their report then, that most of the time scientists kind of generally referred to one of the middle of the road scenarios and that they were the ones that they would often quote in talks as well when we look at this scenario what does this mean for our future for temperatures for sea ice for sea level rise for whatever it is that they were talking about well at this congress the scenario that i m heard most often referred to was the worst case scenario rcp 8.5 now i don't know exactly what that means does that mean that science has given up on humankind's ability to do something about this problem right now, um, to address it, to stop emitting? Does it mean that actually, even if we do stop emitting, the scenarios are that much worse than we had previously predicted? And I'm not sure. But what it indicates to me most certainly is that we do need to be taking this seriously. It is unlikely we're going to stop emitting carbon concentrations tomorrow. And even if we did, maybe the outcome because of what we've already pumped into the atmosphere is worse than we feared. So what does all that mean? Well, you may remember um, the global warming report that the IPCC put out in the fall of last year. And this report was all about looking at how um, warming of one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels, we're at one degree now. So going up another half a degree, the global average, if we went up one and a half degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, what that means for our planet versus going up to two degrees above pre-industrial levels for the planet. And what does that mean? And this report was... Uh, I mean, it's a huge report. I only read the technical summary, but it looked at so many different factors and really, really clearly laid out the different scenarios. 
And I mean, the difference is huge. You think it's only half a degree. We're at one degree now. We're talking about, okay, going up to one and a half, going up to two degrees. Big deal. Doesn't seem like it should be such a big deal. Well, it is a huge deal. Going up to one and a half degrees, which we are locked into, by the way, without it, it's going to be at minimum one and a half degrees, means losing most of our coral reefs. Going up to two degrees means losing all of them makes a significant difference in the number of um, oppressive heat days, in the frequency of droughts, in the frequency of floods, in biodiversity loss, in food and water scarcity, just that half a degree. And here's the scary thing. This worst case scenario that I referred to, this RCP 8.5, when that scenario is plugged into models, the models say that we're not just going to go up to one and a half degrees by the end of the century. We're not just going to go up to two degrees by the end of this century. We're going to go up to four degrees by the end of this century. That's huge. If we went up to four degrees Celsius temperature rise over such a short period of time, the resulting changes would be catastrophic. We would be talking extreme heat waves, species extinctions, water and food scarcity, mass migration, and sea level rising that would affect hundreds of millions of people. This scenario is pretty frightening, and that's why we want to take this information in now. That's why we want to face this problem, and that's why we want to take action right now, because that is not the scenario that we want. So with a lot of what's been going on in the world lately, it is uh, the 2nd of August today. Um, the Arctic continues to burn. Uh, we had record heat waves in Europe this summer, and there's a big lump of heat now sitting over Greenland. Um, there's been a lot of talk about melting ice, Greenland melting, Antarctica melting. So I just want to briefly touch on melting ice and sea level rise. Needless to say, at this Congress, there were lots of sessions on ice, on Greenland, on the Arctic, on Antarctica, and I sat in on a lot of these sessions. Um, the Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society has a lot of researchers that do some really incredible work in the Arctic. And of course, the Arctic is a huge part of Canada. Canada has the largest coastline of any country in the world, um, mostly because of our Arctic coastline. A lot of Canada's people inhabit the North. So what does climate change mean for the Arctic? Well, I mean, it's no big secret that the Arc is changing dramatically. The Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else on the planet. Its landscape is changing faster than anywhere else on the planet. Um, huge losses being recorded all the time in multi-year ice and summer sea ice. Uh, I went to one talk that was quite interesting, a researcher looking at clear skies data, so taking satellite images and putting together composite pictures, so cloud-free pictures, beautiful images of Canada's north since 2000 for the summer periods and looking at how summer sea ice is affected year after year depending on what's going on with with global temperatures and these past 19 years have showed us a slow but sure loss in summer sea ice uh, the melt in the summer of 2019 happened particularly early this is having a huge effect on the people of the north that live there the our inuit population um, it's devastating communities and devastating them in ways that we don't wouldn't even necessarily think of apparently some of the communities up there have recently become so infested with ticks because of that temperature change ticks have now migrated north and Lyme disease is another big problem so not only do they not have access to some of their land because of ice loss to their ways of living the very ground underneath them as permafrost is melting is going species are changing new disease is being introduced I guess I was somewhat heartened um, to hear about the number of projects that are going on in Canada's north that seem to be genuinely working with the people that live there. Um, there's one project in particular that's worth mentioning, Arctic Net, that seems to be a pretty uh, genuine collaboration between science government, industry, and Inuit populations. It's hearing about projects like these, I guess, that do give me some hope for us to be able to respond and, and adapt if 
there is a solution. It is certainly only going to be found by working together. I just briefly mentioned melting permafrost. This is a concern, of course, for people that live locally as the very ground underneath them melts and changes their how they can travel, how they can live, how they can build, if they can live and build. Um, but this is also a big global concern. So melting permafrost releases methane. Methane is another carbon gas. Um, methane is, although it accounts for only 4% of the atmospheric carbon concentration, Concentrations. It is responsible for more than 20% of the warming. So it's a much more effective greenhouse gas. Uh, methane comes because it is the result of decaying or organic matter. Um, decaying organic matter that was frozen and locked in the soil. The soil melts and this gas is released. So not only is the world losing a lot of its sea ice, um, there's also a lot of talk about melting glaciers. In another talk I went to, I learned that there are about 215,000 glaciers around the world. And most of these are retreating. Most of these are melting, some by kilometers a year. Now, if all of these melted at once, we would be looking at about 30 centimeters of sea level rise. Now, as part of this talk, the researcher mentioned that there is an interesting thought about how maybe melting glaciers could be used as a resource. And the thought was this, as glaciers retreat, they produce all this melt water. What if dams were built and we generated hydroelectricity from this melt water? Now, of course, many of these sites would be unsuitable for building dams, and the resulting contribution to our overall energy demands would probably be quite small. But what I found heartening about this was just that it was a totally novel idea that I would have never thought of. How many more ideas are there out there just waiting to be thought of that may actually be viable? So I've mentioned sea ice, glaciers. Now the big talk these days is around ice sheets, uh, the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. There were lots of great talks on this subject. In one talk, I uh, learned that Greenland is losing quite a lot of ice, mostly at its periphery. Greenland is unbelievably thick, the Greenland ice sheet. It's like two to three kilometers thick but it is losing volume. Uh, in the period of 2010 to 2018, so in eight years, it lost about four to five meters at its periphery in height. Now, what would happen if two to three kilometers of sea ice over Greenland melted entirely? And just to say, keep breathing, <laughs> because this is not gonna happen overnight. This is, you know, we are losing some volumes of Greenland. We're going to lose more. Sea level is going to rise because of it. But two to three kilometers of ice is not going to happen overnight. It's not even going to happen over the next few decades or even the next hundred years. This would probably take, scientists estimate, hundreds of years to maybe a thousand years to happen. So this is not going to happen overnight. But if three kilometers of sea ice over Greenland melted, we would be looking at about an eight meter sea level rise. So very significant would severely impact our coastlines. And we are on track for about a meter of sea level rise from the melting of Greenland um, that is going to happen at some point in the future because of how our climate is warmed, because of how much the melt is happening and the trajectories that are that are depicted. So we are definitely going to be looking at a meter of sea level rise from Greenland no matter what we do at some point in the future. Now, what about Antarctica? The Antarctica ice sheet is much more vast than that of Greenland. 60% of the world's fresh water is locked up in the Antarctica ice sheet. East Antarctica is pretty stable. West Antarctica is another matter. Apparently 25% of that is on risk of collapse. What if all of Antarctica melted? So if Greenland melted, we would get about eight meters of sea level rise. What if all of Antarctica melted? What would that mean for sea level? It would mean a 60 meter sea level rise. There is so much water locked up in Antarctica. Now again, this is not going to happen overnight, but how much of this ice sheets melts and how quickly depends on the action that we take or that we don't take today. 
So what is going to happen? Well, by the end of this century, we are committed to up to a meter of sea level rise. Up to a meter of sea level rise. A lot of the world's major cities sit at or very close to sea level. This would significantly impact our cities, significantly impact where we live, how we live, would cause incredible displacement of urban populations. In Canada, um, we are probably looking at, by the end of this century, by about 80 centimeters of sea level rise for the Atlantic, about 60 centimeters for the Pacific, and maybe more like 20 centimeters for the Arctic. Um, just as an aside, uh, sea level rise is going to be lower in the Arctic because of something called isostatic rebound. So that is the phenomenon of some of the land in the north still rising because of the weight of the ice that was relieved when all of the glaciers melt, melted. So there was so much ice in the last ice age weighing down on that land. The land had sunk. That ice has been relieved and still 12,000 years later, some of that land is still rebounding. So it's going to slightly counteract sea level rise in some parts of the north. But for the rest of Canada in the next 80 years, our Atlantic and Pacific coastlines are going to be seriously affected. And that's not an if. I mean, that's what we're looking at because of how much warming we've put into the atmosphere already. All right, is it going to be 80 centimeters? Well, maybe it'll be 20 centimeters more, 20 centimeters less, but we are looking at significant sea level rise that is going to impact, severely impact our urban populations. What else can we expect for Canada? Well, if you are a snow lover like me, you may be wondering about our winters. Uh, over the next 30 years, I learned in another talk at this Congress, uh, we can expect a 20 to 30 percent reduction in snow volume. And that effect is going to be even more amplified around the Great Lakes. So even more snow loss around the Great Lakes because of the lake effect. What about other forms of precipitation? Well, storms like everywhere that experience storms storms are going to become more severe uh, precipitation events will become more profound why is that well a warm atmosphere holds more water more water in the atmosphere means that more water dumps out on land when there's a storm um, wind events um, may become more severe and may become more frequent and this is really important for Canada. This is really important for everywhere. I mean, the definition of a disaster is an event that overwhelms the capacity of the local um, community to respond. So, I mean, what's a disaster for some places is not a disaster for others. If you live in a brick house, um, it's not really a disaster if you are in a strong wind event. If you live in a straw hut, well, that's a little bit more of a disastrous event. So what this means for Canada and indeed for everywhere is that we need to look at how to how we build our structures at how we live so that these increasing um, wind events don't become disasters for us. In another talk, quite a well-known statistician was talking about how climate data is used by engineers because of course they take um, the climate data. Okay, so what's happened? What are the changes that we've seen? And they extrapolate, well, what can we affect? And then this is what climate scientists do. Engineers do the same thing. Well, what we know is that the climate data that was used in the last few decades to build the structures that still exist today underestimated uh, precipitation and flood events. So a lot of the structures that we have in place are already being overwhelmed by some of the flooding that we're seeing. The places that we built are places where we should not have. Just yesterday, I went for a beautiful kayak on Lake Ontario through the Thousand Islands. And there's so many people out there that have their lovely little cottages on the Thousand Islands. Um, and these cottages are flooded with water. The Great Lakes have risen significantly and are going to continue to do so because of precipita precipitation and flood events and because the Great Lakes are connected to the ocean via the St. Lawrence. So as sea level rises, there's going to be less volume that's able to push down from the Great Lakes out the river and into the sea. 
And there are many places in the world that would probably envy our problem. I mean, dwindling freshwater resources is of huge concern. Uh, the UN has declared a water action decade for the period of 2018 to 2028 to try to deal with this water scarcity problem. Um, and what they have declared at the very center of this report is the human right to access clean, fresh water. The human right. And okay, this isn't a problem that we're going to have to face in Canada, but in lots of other parts of the world it is. The Aral Sea, for example, in Kazakhstan, has shrunk to 10% of its volume uh, in the last 45 years, just 10%, displacing huge amounts of people. And so the impact, the secondary impact of that on places like Canada that have an abundant freshwater supply, in fact we maybe are dealing with too much fresh water, is the global challenge of mass migration, displaced peoples, people that will be having to move from countries that are no longer livable, whether that's because of freshwater scarcity or sea level rise or disasters, um, people that we are responsible for human beings that are residents of this globe that will be looking for a new place to live and where we absolutely can't go with this is fear and separation we really are all in this together and this problem that we find ourselves in is because of separation because we have separated so much from each other so much from the planet so much from the earth we are so disconnected we constantly sacrifice what's really important, the ground under our feet, for materialistic gains, for bits of plastic, for what appears to be solid structures to live in. For what? So much instability. The very foundations under our feet are quaking because of this false sense of security that we constantly try to build all around us. And what all this does, all this apparent security, what all of this does is just create more and more separation and insecurity. And so ironic that all of the things that we buy, all of the things that we build, almost all of the activities that we engage in actually further this problem, further separation, further disconnection, further our crisis. And so what is the solution? I don't know, but it's definitely not in separation. Now is the time to face what's happening, feel our feelings, hold each other, grieve, cry, release, lift our heads up, and figure out what the hell we are going to do. It's not the time for blame, for building walls, for putting energy into isolating ourselves from each other, into creating more separation, into keeping them over there. So I hope that this podcast has helped you maybe understand some of the science a bit better or maybe reminded you of it, maybe helped you to face into what is happening a little bit more. And if you feel something because of it, because of this or because of anything else that you hear in the news, you can use that energy, use that energy that you feel, the frustration, the anger, the grief, use it feel it, take it, bring it through your body and turn it into action. That energy can propel you into action, whatever kind of action you want to take. That's what this podcast is in part for me. There's lots of other things that I try to do with my life every day. Every decision I make is a result of trying to do something with all of those feelings, turn it into positive action. The most significant thing that we can do right now is to try to affect decisions. So are the, the leaders, the people in charge, a lot of them have a vested interest in proving that climate science is wrong. That's why it's so important that scientists continue to do this work, that they continue to further strengthen their studies, that they continue to show what's happening, that they fill any possible holes because there's a lot of leaders that are looking for holes and are looking to try to find ways to not take action. We need to make this a top priority. We need to tell the people in charge that this needs to sit at the top of every political discussion. Is this an emergency? If it's an emergency, it needs to be involved in every decision, no matter what it is that we're talking about. Are we talking about building roads? Are we talking about housing? Are we talking about jobs? Whatever it is, 
This piece has to come in. It's an emergency. And you have to come in. This emergency needs every single one of us in whatever ways we can affect our surroundings, in whatever ways we can impact each other and this planet in a positive way. So please don't give up. And if you haven't started yet, definitely don't give up. We really need you. Thank you for listening.